Listen now in the reading of Scripture for the word and wisdom of God. Open our hearts to the word and wisdom of God. Today's lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That passage starts with, woe. <laughs> you know you're in for a real corker when the Bible passage starts with, woe. It's one of those prophetic readings that, oh man, we're going to rain down all kinds of judgment on us this time, aren't we? Anybody quaking in their feet when you hear the word woe coming out on the Bible reading? Oh, I see a couple of nodding heads. Okay, so most of you aren't that scared. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, well let's, try, let's try this again. Um, the Gospel reading comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 to 43. And I think it starts out with a pretty tough line, too. When they came to the place that is called the skull, see, told you it was coming, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah. He is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself. And us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, Amen. thanks be to God. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Thus begins the gospel reading for the reign of Christ, or Christ the King Sunday, the Sunday where we proclaim the rulership of Christ over any earthly powers, where we extol the virtues of Christianity over any secular authorities or powers, where we praise meekness over pomp and circumstance, where we give blessing to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, where we teach our children to love truth and humility over manipulation and arrogance. Do you see where it gets us? Teaching justice. Walking in the way of Jesus. Learning to love one another and to turn the other cheek. Do you see where the Prince of Peace is? Atop the place that is called the Skull. Which sounds like it comes out of a He-Man cartoon. Crucified in pain 
and agony with criminals. A person mocked, scorned, abandoned by even his closest followers. It's not a really good recruitment tool for churches. Why? Well, why is Jesus there? Well, he said things. He said things, such as, blessed are the poor. And in his society, like ours, the poor were generally regarded as having earned their poverty. But he said that God blessed them. He did things such as chasing out the money lenders from the temple of God. They extorted wealth from religious pilgrims to Jerusalem, many of them whom were poor. Those who profited from this practice and those who had tolerated it so long that it had become normal worried about what changes he might try to enact next. He gave people hope, healing them even when he wasn't supposed to on the Sabbath day. He offended many, but those he offended could afford to be offended. They had enough, and probably more than enough, for human thriving. Yet he listened to the woman who dismissed him as a dog, or whom he dismissed as a dog for not being Jewish, and changed his mind about her, calling his faith great. He used his small following as a platform for social change. Upsetting those who profited off of poverty. Upsetting those who harmed the oppressed. Upsetting those who manipulated their power and their position for their own gain. And what was his reward for being a prophetic presence whose words and deeds challenged comfortable assumptions? He was taken to a place called the skull derided, mocked, scorned, and crucified between two criminals. How did they, the criminals, wind up there? On September 30th of 2015, the state of Georgia executed Kelly Gissendowner. In 1997, Gissendowner was Gissendonner plotted the murder of her husband, Douglas. There was no real doubt of her guilt, and the details of the trial are chilling. She was sentenced to death in 1998. During her time on death row, she underwent a full conversion. She received a theology degree from Emory University, Candler School of Theology, and started a pen pal relation with one of the 20th century's most celebrated theologians, Jürgen Moltmann, who lives in Germany, Professor Moltmann prayed with the devotional book that she wrote as her graduating project. His conversion, by the way, came as a prisoner of war after being captured by the British in World War II and then developing a theology of hope amidst the ashes of rebuilding Germany. He flew to Atlanta to award her her degree in prison in 2011. Moved by her repentance and conversion, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people appealed to the governor of Georgia to rescind Kelly's death sentence. The signatories of this appeal included prison guards who had found her ministry to have a calming effect on other inmates, especially those with mental illness. Nor was hers an easy thing. As she lost her appeal, she asked, where is God in all of this? She got angry at God, telling one of her professors, I'm mad. I'm having trouble praying. The same professor, Jennifer McBride, was with her when her final petition for clemency was denied, describing the letter as pure evil, wrapped in this respectability and law. She was executed, an act that shows that human systems of justice are often fixated upon vengeance rather than reconciliation. We don't know much about the two criminals who were crucified next to Jesus. Even though Jesus' prophetic voice and actions led to the cross, the presence of two so-called criminals crucified in the same place is not highlighted to show the ignominy of Jesus' end. Rather, 
They visibly demonstrate how right injustice was, was in the society of Jesus' time, a society that killed people for straying outside the boundaries of respectability and law and order, that failed to follow the rules of those with corruptible power. It highlights how little mercy and forgiveness was in their society. Gissendoner's execution reminds us, too, that the quality of mercy is lacking in our society as well. It reminds us that even not being prophetic, even trying to reconcile one's way of living to getting right with God, can wind up in execution. On the Sunday where we proclaim the reign of Christ, what exactly do we proclaim? Do we proclaim a Christ triumphant over all things, including death, and trumpet this out to the world? Can we engage in such triumphalism when we continue to execute people in pure evil wrapped in respectability and law? It is no wonder to me that people lose their faith if the church projects such a message. Last week, Saturday Night Live, a comedy sit show, opened with a communal lament. Kate McKinnon, a comedian who has been the show's actor portraying Hillary Clinton, opened the show with the sobering and heartbreaking tones of the late Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. A comedy show on Saturday night opened with a communal lament of a cold and broken hallelujah. One needs not have been a Hillary supporter to be moved by this opening and the loss that it portrayed. I could not help though, I could not help but realize that the faith community is not sought by people to be the place that expresses our nation's lament. All too often we are called to be a place that tells you to think positively and be happy and try to be joyful. And yet, when there is a real time of grieving, when there is a real time of loss, for not just those within a congregation, but for the entire country as a whole, we are sidelined or ignored, in part because Saturday Night Live can do it better, in part because perhaps we have also become lukewarm, not passionate, not on fire, not lit up with that light of God that is in each and every single one of us, but so busy trying to make sure that we are nice, that we are respectable, that people like us no matter what not in forgetting that we are called to proclaim something that could get us on a hill called the skull. What do we do with that? What do we do with that passion, with that fire, with that courage that comes from living in this way of Jesus that does uncomfortably call us into question and should make us doubt our own way of living? How do we go to be a place where truth is proclaimed and told, willing if not compelled, to live in the way of our Savior, even if that will get us criminalized in the way that Jesus himself was criminalized by the power brokers of his day? The prophet Jeremiah understood that faith leaders were irrelevant when they ceased to be shepherds to the people. Woe to you shepherds who have ceased to tend the flock. Because of our society's nice Christmas pageants and popular pictures of Jesus as a shepherd, we tend to forget that shepherding is actually a really arduous task and a difficult job. My mentor and friend, the Reverend Burke Keller, who baptized Floyd here in June, helped lead an effort in North Northumberland, England, just south of the Scottish border, to record the stories of shepherds of that time. 
The generation to generation task of shepherding sheep in those stark, cold, lonely, beautiful lowlands had come to an end. A victim of global trade where wool could be produced far cheaper elsewhere in the world. The recordings made with the backing of the Prince of Wales were the last chance to capture the stories of these shepherds and what onerous work they did. Sleepless nights in the hills, or little sleep under the damp and wet stars, looking after lambs as they had wandered away from the flock, searching high and low in crevices and pitfalls and down narrow sheep paths well before the time of cell phones when there was no way to contact anyone to let them know where you were. Lonely nights together. I worry that we may have lost our shepherds today too. I worry that we fear the loneliness and the coldness of what it means to shepherd a flock through difficult times. I worry that we have ceded our prophetic role to others in attempts to be nice and gentle and meek and mild, forgetting that Jesus was fiery and temperamental, confrontational and yet able to listen, healing and yet dividing those who would not heed the essence of his lessons. I worry, but I do not despair. Because I see in front of me the shepherds of the flock. Each, in your own way, is a shepherd. And I ask you not to confine that still speaking voice of God within you to the confines of your own body, but to open your mouth so your lips shall proclaim God's praise. You who have eyes, you who have ears to hear, look and listen, for we cannot relinquish our God-given role to be shepherds, to journey alongside one another on cold, damp nights and into forgotten places, protecting those around us from harm and raising up those who are gifted with the qualities of leadership. To be shepherds of our community, the moral voice of our place, the voice of hope and justice and healing, that voice now the voice that calls out the powerful when they oppress the children of God amongst us, we must be willing to rise up. To rise up. To rise up, you must have confidence that God is calling you, and we must not give in to the fear and the despair that comes from the place called the skull, where being a prophetic presence will brand us as criminals and place us up with others. We must rise up to love mercy, to love kindness, to know that that might make us lonely, to know that that will put us off our guard, to know that that might put us into those cold, damp nights, as perhaps was discovered by one of us on Thursday, delivering the lighthouse meals to those in homelessness camps around the county. That is our call. And you've got it. With each heartbeat that you have, you hear it right next to it. Your call. Don't silence it. Don't silence it. But let it sing out. As Kate McKinnon did last Saturday in a cold and broken but full of passion and fire. Hallelujah.